Good evening. My name is Natalia Fedorshak, and I am a student project manager at the Clark Forum for Contemporary Issues at Dickinson College. Before we begin, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that Dickinson College is on the unceded lands of the Susquehannock Nation. We hereby recognize the prior status and enduring diversity of this land and the many indigenous nations that stand in relation to it, particularly the thousands of indigenous children from dozens of tribes forced into the reprogramming camp established at the Carlisle Indian Industrial School starting in 1879. Dickinson College supported this agenda of cultural eradication in both word and deed. Turning honestly towards that shameful past animates this acknowledgement and gives orientation to our desire for a reconciled future. Accordingly, this living land acknowledgement is intentionally incomplete, a reflection of the ongoing process it represents, to learn respectfully from the stories of this land and the peoples that carry them, to think reflectively about the injustice in our shared past, and act responsibly with that knowledge today to inspire a more equitable tomorrow. On behalf of the Clark Forum, Dickinson College, the Departments of History, French, and Francophone Studies, as well as the Military Science and Middle East programs, I would like to welcome you to tonight's event, the Beirut Barracks Bombing of 1983, the stories that America needs to hear. Tonight, Dr. James Breckenridge, Mr. Michael Gaines, and Professor, Professor Murray Rebez will discuss the Beirut Barracks Bombing of 1983 the deadliest single-day attack on the United States Marine Corps since the Battle of Iwo Jima in 1945. With a death toll of 307 US and French servicemen in two separate but simultaneous attacks, the upcoming 40th year anniversary of this devastating incident reminds us to honor those who lost their lives as well as those who survived this attack. Tonight's panelists will review the importance of remembrance, consider the timeline of events that occurred in the Lebanese Civil War, leading up to the attack on October 23rd, 1983, and highlight the US military's role as a peacekeeper during that time. Dr. James G. Breckenridge has served as provost of the United States Army War College, serving as chief academic officer and senior civilian at the college. Dr. Breckenridge has acted as founding dean of the Ridge College of Intelligence Studies and Applied Sciences at Mercyhurst University creating partnerships with the Department of State, Department of Defense, Department of Homeland Security, and networks of experts in numerous fields. With a military career of 22 years, Dr. Breckenridge has designed and taught courses in intelligence analysis and leadership to executives in the Department of State, Department of Defense, Department of Homeland Security, and the Department of Energy. Dr. Breckenridge has been honored with the Legion of Merit, as well as other military awards. Mr. Michael A. Gaines, alongside his family, founded the William R. Gaines Jr. Veteran Memorial Fund in 2017 in order, to order, in order to honor the memory of his older brother who lost his life at age 21 in the Beirut barracks bombing. In Florida, Mr. Gaines and the William R. Gaines Jr. Veteran Memorial Fund is currently working alongside Charlotte County to develop a 40-acre waterfront community park named after Marine Corporal William R. Gaines Jr. The organization is currently building a Beirut Peacekeepers Memorial Tower honoring veterans and first responders who served and died in Beirut from 1982 to 1983. In 1999, Mr. Gaines co-founded GSL Solutions Incorporated, a technology company that has acted as the largest provider of websites built for the United States Senate and House of Representatives. Mr. Gaines currently serves as chairman on the board of Empath Hospice in Hillsborough County, Florida. Professor Murray Rebez is an associate professor of French and Francophone studies and women's gender and sexuality studies at Dickinson College. She's currently completing her second doctorate in international law, terrorism, and human rights at Penn State Dickinson Law. Professor Rebez's research focuses on intersectionality of law, gender, sexuality, oral history, and trauma in the context of armed conflicts, specifically in the Middle East and North Africa. Professor Rebez's first book, Gendering Civil War, Francophone Women's Writing in Lebanon, was nominated for the John Leonard Prize. Currently, Professor Rebez is working on her second book 
on Hezbollah's activities in Lebanon from 1982 to today. On the back of this evening's program, you will find a QR code. We would appreciate if you complete the survey to provide feedback on how you find out about Clark Forum events. Immediately following the program, there will be a question and answer session. So please hold all questions until that time. The Clark Forum welcomes differences of opinion expressed thoughtfully, politely, and succinctly. Disruptive behavior or harassment of the speakers, members, members of the Dickinson community, or audience members will not be tolerated. As a show of respect for our speakers and everyone in attendance, please stay until the question and answer session has completed. In the event of an emergency, please note that accessible exits are located on the west side of the building. And at this time, I ask that you silence all cell phones and electronic devices, and please welcome our panelists. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, I'm gonna talk here because Dickinson likes high podiums, so I'll disappear behind here. So, um, so in the words of Ronald Reagan, he said once, some people live an entire lifetime and wonder if they made a difference in the world. But the Marines don't have that problem. <laughs> and so as such, I would like to say that the Beirut veterans you certainly don't have that problem because you did make a difference. And I would like to recognize your presence here. So if I could ask you to please stand and be recognized. Thank you, folks. So I'm going to start by talking about what happened in Lebanon. And so um, Lebanon is a very tiny, tiny country in West Asia. Whoops, I don't know what happened here. Um, and it's, it's the size of Delaware and Rhode Island combined. Um, this is the Lebanese flag. And for the students here, um, this is not a Christmas tree. It's a cedar tree. And Lebanon is known for the cedar tree. Um, Lebanon is known for religious diversity, so we don't have any one religious group that, is, that holds a majority. There are five Muslim groups, there are 12 Christian groups, and there's one Jewish group in Lebanon. So as such, according to recent statistics, um, roughly 30% of Lebanese are Muslim Sunnite, roughly about 30% are Shiite, and the rest is mixed between Christian and a handful, a very small number of Jewish living in Lebanon. And this is important diversity to know, but also not holding any majority caused a lot of issues in Lebanon. So it's important to go back a little bit in time. Under the Ottoman Empire, which is Turkey today for the students again, um, Lebanon um, was part of the Ottoman Empire, and as such, its first recorded religious war goes back to 1860. And so what happened under the Ottoman Empire, the Christians of the mountain, Mount Lebanon, were heavily taxed. And at some point, they rebelled against the taxation. And that created a lot of sectarian violence be between the Maronites, so which is a uh, Christian group, and the Druze in the mountains. And this is where Lebanon knew its first military intervention. Actually, under the pressure of the West, um, the Ottoman Empire agreed that 12,000 European soldiers come to Lebanon, including France, Great Britain, Prussia, Austria, and um, there's one more that I'm forgetting, but it's not a problem. But point being is sectarian violence is not new to the region, but the other thing is military intervention in Lebanon is not new either. Um, the other thing that happened, so we fast forward a little bit, we're in World War I, World War I, we have the Great Famine of Lebanon in 1915. It's often a disregarded fact in history. It happened simultaneously at the same time as the Armenian Genocide. So what happened? The Allies imposed a um, block on the, on the Mediterranean Sea, so all the, uh, all the crops going into Lebanon were deviated for the Allies, but the point was to weaken the, empire, the Ottoman Empire. But on the other hand, the Ottoman Empire wanted to suffocate the rebels, specifically the Christians in the Mount Lebanon. And that therefore, there was a great famine in 1915 that resulted in the killing of 200 
thousand um, Lebanese, mostly Christian. At the same time as that was happening, we had the background of the Armenian genocide. Move for a little bit further in history, you have the secret agreement of Sykes-Picot, which kind of divided the area and the region between the French um, influence and the British influence. In short, what this did is like it puts Lebanon under the French mandate and historical Palestine under British mandate. All of this is happening at the same time. 1917, I don't know why this is skipping. 1917, we have the Balfour Declaration. At that point, Great Britain also had colonial um, ambition in the region. And therefore, in order to guarantee that, there, that the people of Palestine are going to stand with the allies, they proclaim that there shall be the creation of a Jewish home in Palestine under the condition that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. So the point is there's a lot of movement happening in the region, none of which the people of the region are deciding it. On the other hand, there's a lot of sectarian violence happening. What happened is Lebanon was put under the French mandate and was proclaimed as a state on September 1st, 1920. So Lebanon and the cur current borders that we know are actually very recent. It's a state as we know it today that is roughly about 100 years old. In September 1st, 1920, the French drew the Lebanese borders. They literally took the Syrian, the Great Syria map, and they drew the Lebanese border. And this is how Lebanon, as we know it today, was born. Unfortunately, under the, the French mandate, there was religious segregation because the French mandate privileged a lot the Christians, particularly the Maronites, and therefore it created, again, tensions between the various fractions of the Lebanese society. Which, oops, I don't know what I did. Okay, so which brings me to the first intervention in Lebanon in 1958. Camille Chamaoun was the second Lebanese president, and he wanted to extend his mandate um, against the Constitution to have a second, um, second round. And um, that created a lot of opposition within Lebanon. And interestingly enough, the opposition came from both the Muslims and the Christians. However, he disregarded that, and he still wanted to continue with the second mandate. And at that time, we had the Eisenhower Doctrine. And so the Eisenhower Doctrine, basically, in a nutshell, um, anyone, any state at risk of aggression could call on the United States either for economic assistance or for military force. And by aggression, it was meant that that was a way to fight Soviet expansion or communism at the time. So Camille Chamoun called on the Eisenhower Doctrine and the United States sent its first military intervention in the Middle East, the Marines and the Army, in 1958. And... Um, it's important to note that the military, the American military was already based in Saudi Arabia, but actually the first combat that was witnessed in that region was in Lebanon in 1958. It's interesting because that, some, that event, while some people consider it military intervention, other, till today, call it invasion. And as historians, we know that words matter because um, some consider it invasions, other consider it aid, other consider it aggression, and all of these terms have a meaning. It changes the perception of the role of the United States in the region. At the same time at that happening, so I'm going to step back a little bit, we had the proclamation of the State of Israel in 1948. What that meant, it meant that many Palestinians fled historical Palestine that became Israel and ended up in neighboring countries such as Syria, Jordan, and Lebanon. The problem that happened is many came as refugees, but at some point, many of these refugees got organized into fighters. They started, they started the Palestinian Liberation Organization, which had quarters in Jordan, but at some point it was expelled. And then it moved to Lebanon and, took, and, and created its quarters in Lebanon. The problem is that Lebanon was a weak state at the time. And so in 1969, Lebanon signed an agreement called the Cairo Agreement, which basically effectively allowed for Palestinian fighters located in South Lebanon to fight against Israel on the borders. And if you look at it from a legal perspective, it's a creating a state within a state because the, the army, the Lebanese army, no longer held the monopoly of force. And therefore, 
Palestinian fighters, at that time we had about 20,000 Palestinian fighters at the borders. They were launching attacks, continuous military attacks, from Lebanese soil on northern Israel, which divided the Lebanese public opinion between those who wanted to fight Israel and those who wanted to sign peace with Israel. And of course, as everything is in the Middle East, it takes a sectarian role. And so it became the Christians want to sign peace with Israel and um, the Muslim wanted to fight with the Palestinian. This is a great, great um, simplification, but that's how it was perceived. And so as such, the war exploded on April 13, 1975 with the infamous bus incident. Uh, Palestinians fighters were harassing Christians um, um, that Sunday morning, they were harassing Christians coming out of church, and in retaliation, um, the right-wing Christian militia, the Falangists, opened fire on a bus, killing effectively 22 Palestinian, fighter, uh, Palestinian civilians. And that on moment, the war started. It lasted roughly about 16 years, and the consequences of this war are not even over. We still have um, 17,000 people in Lebanon unaccounted for and disappeared. A lot of people still are in, prison, in Syrian jails. Lebanon is still under Iranian occupation in many ways. But I do want to say that the war started 75. If we fast forward to 1982, this is where Israel have had enough and said, OK, we're going to launch the Operation Peace for Galilee, which the point was to come into Lebanon, invade Lebanon, but also put a stop to the Palestinian fighters launching attack on Israeli soldiers. And therefore, as of 1982, Lebanon was under Israeli invasion. And this, I'll leave the floor for my colleague, Dr. Breckenridge, to continue the story. I guess you don't have a problem with the first yeah, no. <laughs> Well, good evening, everybody, and a special, uh, special thanks and, and uh, to our Beirut veterans out there for making some rather lengthy journeys to get here tonight. Uh, it's great to see you, brothers in arms, and hopefully uh, we'll be able to connect again here after the swap some stories. Um, the piece that uh, I'm going to talk about is to well, also thank Murray for laying such a great foundation in terms of trying to understand this particular event. Um, I have a personal stake in this in that um, I was there with you on that day, on 23rd of October, 1983, and lost four of my soldiers and Marines in the bombing, and was an eyewitness to that tragedy both before and afterwards. So um, as I speak tonight, I'm speaking um, uh, in retrospective mode, and but from a highly personal uh, vantage point. So my objectivity in, in some cases here is going to be a little bit uh, uh, bended to whim, but I'll do the best I can in trying to be as objective as possible. And my, my intent here is to, is to, as much as possible, along with Michael, as you'll hear, is to emphasize, especially to students, the value of historical memory. And one of those things that we must, as liberal arts institutions, embrace, and much of what uh, I say now will be my opinion, of course, and I'm no longer the War College Provost. I retired in July, and uh, I'm now unemployed but retired. So uh, the opinion is mine. But much of what we have lost in terms of historical memory has also been lost in our attention and our emphasis on curriculum in that regard. And so, Forums like this uh, allow us then to begin to teach and learn as well. So hopefully, um, as, we, as we learn tonight, um, we'll carry these particular lessons back, back in the classroom. The, the, the sort of prologue then that I would like to emphasize is this, which is this particular event, um, and it's a series of events leading to 23 October 1983, is deeply influential in terms of American politics. And we'll get to that so what here in a few minutes. It's also deeply influential in terms of American military reorganization and our approach to how it is we fight. And I'll get to that. And finally, it's deeply, deeply influential in terms of our Middle Eastern partners and allies. 
They learned from Beirut that day. They took some of those lessons and used them in nefarious ways. You can watch a train of terrorist events occur after that. So this is really the first in a series. You're present at the creation of the specter of terror as it intrudes into the 21st century. And it's Beirut that launches those particular, um, particular events in many ways and the perception of them. So again, as I sum up, I'll get into some of that reorganization perception and policy sort of implications. Um, so Murray left us off in what was a cauldron of violence, and that's, that's Beirut, 1982. And uh, in September of 1982, um, we see the Marines arrive, and why are they there? Um, well, you've got to go back really to a memo written from the Joint Chiefs of Staff. This is the head of the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps. And this is what they wrote in June before Marines even arrive in September. So the point here simply is, this is a signal that within the body politic, especially in the military right zone, early on, there is resistance to this mission at the strategic level. So as we move forward a couple months into September, the Marines arrive, small contingent at first, in early to mid-September, and they're there to evacuate the PLO. The PLO have now been surrounded by the Israeli Defense Forces, what we will call the IDF. Um, and this is our way of sort of tamping the violence down, and the Marines, along with Italians and French soldiers, are used as a vehicle to bring about that evacuation of PLO fighters to bring some normality to a very violent situation. And so Yasser Arafat and his contingent head off to Tunis. Some end up in Yemen, and others uh, end up in Libya. But now you have a vacuum, so to speak, and who fills it? Uh, shortly thereafter, the president of Lebanon is assassinated. He's a Maronite Christian. That's constitutionally mandated. And when he's assassinated now, we begin the cycle that's typical in Lebanon that you heard from Murray of grievance and revenge. And so what is the revenge? The IDF has surrounded two very prominent Palestinian refugee camps called Sabra and Shatila. And they conveniently allow phalangist forces associated with the Maronite government to enter those camps to commit systematic slaughter of civilians. The sons and the daughters and the wives of those PLO fighters who had been evacuated. And so, if you were to go back and watch the evening news, ABC, NBC, CBS, those who dominated the airways in those days, we weren't the fragmented, atomized social media that we are today. It was there, it was staring at you right at the six o'clock news with Jennings and, and his ilk. And they were, they, were, they were showing every night the consequences of these massacres. And so you have a guilt-ridden president of the United States, Ronald Reagan, saying, what do I do? Don't do it. On the other hand, he has a very prominent series of cabinet members. And I'll list them really quickly. Casper Weinberger, Sec Secretary of Defense, and had been a highly influential Republican politician for many years. George Shultz, who had been a former Secretary of, of uh, Commerce and uh, head of the Office of Budget and Finance, was now Secretary of State. And so you have a very powerful administration. The Chief of Staff is a good friend of of Ronald Reagan, and finally the National Security Advisor and the Special Envoy of the Middle East is a guy named Robert McFarland. So those are the players who are going to begin to argue about, do we do it or do we not? And the argument that wins out is, we'll send along with our Italian and French counterparts, as, as he talks to Francois Mitterrand and the Italian president, prime minister, we'll send contingents of about 1,500 um, soldiers and Marines apiece to Beirut 
to do what? Well, our answer to that, the U.S. answer to that, is to interpose and provide presence. That's the mission. Now think about those two words. Interpose means to separate factions, to position yourself between factions, right? And presence means what? To show yourself, to expose yourself, to say, here I am. And so think about that mission in September of 1982 because it just doesn't work as things begin to escalate. You can't be exposed, and you can't be between and betwixt, right? So the Marines are there now on a semi-permanent basis in Beirut in September of 1982. 1,500 strong, sharing responsibilities with Italian and Frenchmen. I'll show you a series of cartoons because I think these get to how Marines, or as, and to a degree, a small group of soldiers feel about things. Now think about if you're 18 years old and you're thrust into a lecture that was just presented by Murray, and you're saying, what? What is all this? It's difficult to understand, especially if your mission is presence. What does that mean in terms of my rules of engagement? What does that mean in terms of my patrol? What does that mean in terms of do I load or can't, you know, all the things that um, combat infantrymen have to weigh on a minute by minute basis. So the debate begins within the administration amongst the players I just talked about. And also instrumental in that is a chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff named John Vesey, Jack Vesey. Uh, Jack was a famous soldier, much older uh, than former chairman, um, who had uh, been highly decorated in Vietnam and received the Distinguished Service Cross. He was adamantly opposed to a large presence in Lebanon, as was his boss, the Secretary of Defense. On the other side of the house, you can see a more muscular sort of diplomacy and a large military force, which was argued by the guys on the right. The guys on the left argued, if you're going to go large, only go once we've separated the combatants. Now, I'll just stop there for a minute just to sort of reiterate what Murray said. There are a lot of players. But the two most important external players beyond the, the contingents I just identified are the Syrians, whose army is deep inside Lebanon, almost within 10 miles of Beirut and the Israeli Defense Force, who had occupied Beirut. Mortal enemies who had already fought months before. They had their own national interest. So if you're going to solve this problem, or you're going to have a diplomatic solution, the Defense Department is arguing, go large only after we see the two antagonists leave. Will they leave? What's their incentive to do so? So you'll see, as I go through here, what the parties are arguing for. The president sides with the guys on the right. And here's the mission. And just take a minute to look at that, because that's important. What size force is required to do that? We've already, we've already trumped it. We've said it's 1,500 people. 1,500 Marines. That's it. As the months go by, and I'll just as a caveat say this, typically on a Marine deployment, an Army deployment at the same time, it's a six-month period in those days. So you come in in September and you leave six months later and you're replaced by a new, what we would call a new 1,500-man contingent called the Marine Amphibious Unit. And inside that Marine Amphibious Unit is an infantry battalion called the Battalion Landing Team. And so you'll see these mouths, as we call them, rotate every six months. So I'll skip over that only to say that we have 
by, all, by the 23rd of October, we've had quite a lot of experience move through Beirut. In November, December, that particular Marine amphibious unit is required to train and assist the Lebanese Army, what we call the LAF. That's the third big player. Who are the Lebanese Army? Are they Sunni? Are they Shia? Are they Maronite? Are they Greek Orthodox, Greek Catholic? Well, they're all that, but mostly they're Maronite Christians. So if you are, then, of another particular sectarian group, how do you view the Lebanese army? Are they with you, for you, or against you? Increasingly, the Marines and their presence and interposition um, responsibilities are called on to do humanitarian relief. And this picture is just to show you that besides training, equipping, patrolling, etc., they're also in this particular case, feeding uh, the Lebanese population who's trapped by a huge snowstorm in February of 1983. But what have we seen September, since September? We have seen no diplomatic solution to the problem. The Israelis and the Syrians are still there, the Marines are on the ground, and the Lebanese army is increasingly beginning to intrude on the neighborhoods of Beirut. So we haven't turned the temperature down. We've let the pot continue to boil. And at some point, it's going to spill over the sides of the pot. And it does. After a series of attacks on Marine and Italian patrols in March, literally ambushes of those patrols, in April of 1983, A car bomb enters the foyer of the United States Embassy and detonates and kills 60 personnel within the embassy. The entire CIA contingent is killed. Why is that important? They're the only human intelligence, really, that you have on the ground that can tell you the story of the factions and how they are interwoven and how they are adverse to each other. They're all dead now. What does this also signal? It also signals that maybe the mission has changed or should change. By May of 1983, beyond just the bombing of the embassy, which leads to a highly focused effort on the part of American diplomats to reach a solution, rockets and mortar fire begin the impact on the airport. And here you see a picture of Marines taking cover. So I mentioned the airport. Where does this 1,500 person contingent reside? It was felt that when you were given the mission of a presence and inner position, that the best place to do that is a place that controls the transportation and communication network of this capital city. And there's no better place than the Beirut International Airport. It's where flights come in, food comes in, and you can resupply by the sea because the airport's right on the beach. And it has this tremendous aviation building right in the middle of it that has withstood continued Israeli air attacks when the PLO occupied it. So we'll put our headquarters there. And all around the airport, we'll position our infantry companies. And now we've got the spot. So where you see these Marines hunker down is not far from that airport. Again, a strategic decision to interpose and position, followed by an operational tactical decision to do those things. And the best place to do them is at the airport. So hindsight says, why would you ever be there so exposed? It's because it made sense in terms of the mission at the time. And here again, another one. So are we combatants or non-combatants? Are we peacekeepers, peacemakers? What are we? 
we've trained the Lebanese army, so perhaps people looking at that would say, hey, I think you're part of the bad guys. So increasingly, you're going to see intensity ratcheted up in terms of fire in and at the airport, and particularly targeting, targeting the Marines. Some is spillover between the factions fighting each other, but some of it's intentional. And so to the degree that you can locate the source of all this artillery and rocket fire coming in, the Marines did not have that capability. That's why I stand before you today, because the mission was given to the Army, and I formed a Army target acquisition battery that was given the mission to go into the Beirut airport, set up, and detect where all that fire was coming from, pass it to the Marine Corps Combat Operations Center, but more importantly, pass it to the ships offshore for them to fire and for um, the Marine Artillery Battery, also located at, at the airport, to fire as well. So now we have a small group of Army soldiers located at the airport as well. Now, however, we have the capability to hand to whoever envoy, envoy needs it the ability to go to the Israelis or go to the Syrians during negotiation or go to the different factions and say, we know you fired, we know when you fired, we know where you fired from, and we know who you were firing at. So this was leveraged diplomatically. Was it necessary? Thought so at the time. Here was advice from the Joint Chiefs of Staff in response to those July events. You'll see one of the target action radars at the bottom left, the top right are Marine snipers on the top of the battalion landing team headquarters. So I show these slides fairly quickly because I want to give Michael some time here. Um, but <clears throat> the point of August and September of 1983, it's a prelude to tra tragedy. The United States Marine Corps and a small contingent of soldiers now are looked at as part of the problem by a majority of the sectarian militias in Beirut. They are looked at as adversaries. This launches what's called the Mountain War. And so the mountain war that is fought across what was called a mountain range just to the east of Beirut called the Shuf is rather significant. It's no holds barred, ugly, dirty, <clears throat> as you can imagine. It's, it's the worst kind of combat because it's urban combat with no quarter given and no quarter expected. And the Marines are in the middle of it. So what to do? This is what's wrestled with in terms of uh, the administration. And the response simply is that the rules of, engage, rules of engagement must change, and we're fired upon, we will fire back. We will fire if we believe we are threatened. So you can imagine that that fire is fairly effective. So there are members of militias, all militias, who are dying as a result of combat um, with those at the airport. And by September, you can look back, and here begins the, the poor briefing of a company commander to new Marines there in Beirut. So, an ax to grind, certainly. On 19 October of 1983, after a preliminary ceasefire, the commander of the Marine Amphibious Unit, Colonel Tim Garrity's convoy is attacked by a remote control bomb. It's another signal that we're coming after you. And that had been preceded by a series of sniper attacks inside the perimeter before, which the Marines responded to as well. <clears throat> About 6.20, 6.25, um, we now have a pinpoint a little bit later than that. Uh, on a Sunday morning, 23 October, 
a large Mercedes truck circled the parking lot in front of the battalion landing team headquarters, gained his speed, and then sped through the sentry posts that were right in front of that uh, battalion landing team headquarters, went into the foyer of the headquarters, sat for about two or three seconds, and detonated. Now remember, this is a building that had withstood Israeli air attacks. It had po been pockmarked by rockets and artillery fire. But the force of that bomb was so great that it physically lifted the building off the four 15 diameter feet worth of stanchions that anchored the building, lifted it off those into the air, and it imploded on itself and came down. And in the process, killed 241 Marines, sailors, and soldiers, wounded another 60 who had to be evacuated to hospitals inside Beirut, ships offshore, and later into Germany at Landstuhl. And 32 were wounded, but were allowed to come back to duty after being treated. So I think said before, it was the largest loss of life since Iwo Jima, at least the lo largest loss of life in a day. Um, and who was responsible? Well, we'll talk about that perhaps in, in uh, the question and answer, but we can pretty much pinpoint it today. Um, and what was the aftermath and the implications? Well, certainly the Marine amphibious unit that was on the ground was no longer combat effective. So it had to be replaced fairly quickly, and Marines from Camp Lejeune flew in within about four or five days. Now remember that what was left of that battalion landing team had to at, not only continue to do the duties they'd been assigned, but they had to now do triage, casualty evacuation, identifying their buddies. If you also remember, it was during that same period of time that Ronald Reagan launched the invasion of Grenada. And so Marines who were earmarked for that invasion were rerouted to Beirut to substitute for that mal on the ground. The story ends in February 1984 after more casualties in, inflicted by various militias, more Marine casualties, et cetera. But suffice it to say that on the 23rd of October 1983, we have a strategic intelligence failure on par at that time with the intelligence failure that occurred on 7 December 1941, Pearl Harbor. And it had equivalent effect. What was that effect? In the aftermath of this particular bombing, a commission called the Long Commission was reformed to investigate cause and implications and responsibility and accountability. It was later followed by an investigation on the, by the House Armed Services Committee, and that subcommittee was chaired by a, a man by the name of Bill Nichols, a congressman from Alabama. That's significant. He had lost constituents in the bombing. And it's Bill Nichols who goes to Barry Goldwater, and by 1986 they have paired up to pass what's called the Goldwater Nichols Act. It reformed the Department of Defense and <clears throat> took accountability and responsibility for combat operations globally out of the hands of the service chiefs and gave it to combatant commanders. That was a significant reorganization change. It required officers from all services now if, for promotion to general officer to serve on joint staffs and a number of other, other provisions. Most significant reorganization since 1947 in the National Security Act. So Beirut, when people say a failure, tragedy, et cetera, the nobility of those who serve there, I don't think can be, ever be <clears throat> overestimated. These were true heroes. But their legacy is that <clears throat> out of that came a Defense Department that became much more effective in how it prosecuted both peaceful and combat operations. The second interesting implication is that adversaries, particularly people like Saddam Hussein, 
and those who uh, perpetrated some of these attacks. And I didn't mention the 58 paratroopers who were killed by a simultaneous bombing. <clears throat> Led them to believe that with the uh, retreat of America out of Beirut in February of 1984, that <clears throat> America was not net steadfast in terms of its Middle East policy and would be very reluctant to intervene in the future. That signal was not lost on Saddam Hussein when he launched the invasion of Kuwait in 1990. And it wasn't lost on Osama bin Laden in 1998, leading to 2001. So again, these, in terms of historical memory, we have to remember that these events have a chain of cause and effect that ripples into the future. And so as students, we just, <laughs> this is why we study it. Um, and I've gone much too long in the editorializing, right? So I'll leave it at that. Uh, one last thing, a little bit of a, a poignant moment for, for me. Um, our anniversary, my wife and I have been married for 46 years. Uh, our anniversary is the 22nd of October. And that night before the bombing, I was writing her a note that she kept um, that said, it looks like things have calmed down a little bit here. Um, two years later, our second daughter was born on the 22nd of October. And four years later, our third daughter was born on the 23rd of October. So we celebrate her birthday every year, but we also remember. Thanks very much. Hello, can you honor me? Hello? There we go. I'm going to use the, the microphone and stand out here. And I appreciate you guys coming. I mean, there's a, um, you know, and hopefully I can explain by the end, you know, why I'd be up here with uh, two academics, because I certainly don't have, um, you know, the background that they have. And hopefully I can explain that. But the story I'm going to tell today is, is it's very personal. Um, you know, but I want you to understand that it's not just, you know, my story. So when you hear my story, realize that there are 270 plus other families. Um, Captain Michael Haskell's um, brother's here today, and I just met him for the first time. And, you know, just talking to him for a few minutes, I could tell, I mean, we've, we've, we've struggled through the same things. There's also over 10,000 veterans that served through Beirut over the 1982 to 1984 time period. And all of them have a story. And then there's the people of Lebanon um, and, and what they went through. And so I think, you know, by the end of the, tonight, I'm going to hope to explain, you know, the, the, the Beirut uh, Veterans of America motto is, a duty, you know, the first duty is to remember. And there's a group of uh, families and veterans who have been getting together, and we'll get together this um, 40th anniversary on October 23rd in Jacksonville, North Carolina, at the Beirut Memorial Wall. And we'll remember. Um, the fallen there. But, you know, there's a, a longer story to it, and, and I think I want to start by, you know, talking about these three pictures of these flags um, that are on here. And I think the first one um, is an image of hope. And that's a uh, young Lebanese boy that was jumped up on my brother's Jeep and took that picture. Bill took it and sent it home to us and, you know, said, here's my little friend in, in Beirut. The next flag that you see is the, the American flag in front of the Beirut um, headquarters, the, the Marine headquarters building. And just to the uh, um, inside of that is where the truck drove through. And I see that as a symbol of um, purpose, you know, for why the, the Marines were there. And that last picture, you can't really tell, but it's the, um, that's the American flag. That's that flag that was in a tree after the bomb happened that, that Jim spoke about. So when I say the story is personal, I, I, I kind of want to walk you through, um, you know, my journey and our family's journey, and and then explain how you know I sort of got away from, you know, what what how I felt, personally felt about it, 
to wanting to sort of do more um, and, and share the story with others. And so that first picture that you see is um, Bill with his family. Um, his wife, Carol, took that. And that's the last picture we took together. Um, I was probably, I was, I was 14 at that time. And, you know, they got, he got on a plane, basically went back to um, Camp Lejeune and, and headed off for, for Beirut. The next picture you see up there is the, the picture at the funeral. And that's uh, me and my mom and, and Carol um, at the funeral. And I mean, you kind of look at the pictures and see, but I mean, I was, I was confused, right? I was 14 years old, just lost my big brother. I don't know anything about Beirut. I know there's some people here tonight, you know, students who, who don't know anything about, you know, with the history over there, and that's how I was at the time. Um, and then the, the next picture you see is my family. Uh, my mom's here, my wife's here tonight, and I appreciate them being here, supporting me, but, you know, what, what I want you to see here is that, you know, my kids, I never got to meet my brother. And I think that, that you know, families deal with that. And how you, um, how you remember things can really shape um, your lives. And so they think you know, that's sort of where I am in, in trying to remember my brother and, and his story. So I want to walk into that a little bit. And I think Jim spoke about the um, embassy bombing. And so I kind of want to go through and, and explain to you. Um, Bill had served in an infantry unit in a prior um, float that he was on over in um, the Mediterranean and through Africa. But then when he got back, he, he um, became a sniper and then ended up in the S2 shop. And he was the driver for the S2, which was Captain Walter Went um, Jr. And Bill would drive him all around, um, all around Beirut to get intelligence because they didn't have a lot of intelligence because the CIA and, and a lot of the intelligence had been destroyed. So this picture right here um, is, the, is the building blown up that Bill took in his Jeep. The next picture they see is, is actually them on the other side of that building. That's the Corniche. And there's an image that you saw earlier showing that. But that's him and, and a, a friend of his that are standing there in front of the building that was, you know, somebody took. <clears throat> and, you know, Bill sent these pictures home, and I had them, and, you know, I just always would look at them and just wonder about, you know, what they were, and, um, you know, I didn't know how, I didn't have the, the, the background and the information about it. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, Jim also talked about, and he showed a picture, you know, on September 22nd, when the Marines were getting hit constantly, the, the USS New Jersey fired its 16-inch gun, 16 guns for the first time since Vietnam into the Shoof Mountains, supporting the, the Lebanese Army. Bill wrote a letter that night um, while he was on guard do, on, a, on um, radio watch, and he wrote, a, and it was to us, and we received it. You know, I think shortly after he passed away, after he died. But one of the things he said is, "I believe in our mission here. Um, I believe we belong here, and if I die in the process, I feel like it, I died for a good reason." And I think you can imagine as a family member reading that and just always thinking, "Well, you know, he, he believed that, right? He believed that he died for a purpose." And so you have that, and then this is Bill in front of the, the um, building, and this is a picture of, of the, the barracks, but it was called, the, the, a lot of them referred to it as the Beirut Hilton. And so back home, you know, Bill would always say, oh, I'm safe, I'm in the building. He had friends, a lot of the veterans here tonight were out in line units maybe, and, you know, they were getting shot at, they were getting attacked. Bill was like, oh, we're, you know, we're safe in this building. Um, and this is uh, Captain Went. Um, at the French headquarters, um, which, you know, they were attacked a few minutes after us in a, in a, you know, twin bombing. But, you know, Bill would drive them around. And so this is the picture that Captain Went took. And that, you know, again, I think it, they felt like they were safe in that building. Um, here's another picture. This is uh, Sergeant Yerbera, which was in, in the S2 shop, painting the room. Um, you got a picture of Bill sitting in his rack. Um, and then October 23rd, you know, the building's destroyed, and the, we started getting news back home. Um, the picture that you see there is, um, that's Sergeant Yerbera being pulled out. We see the cover of Time Magazine and recognize him and know that it's him and wonder, you know, well, maybe Bill's okay. Waited five days. You know, I don't know how many, you know, you had an accident, something happens, but, you know, we waited five days hoping that we would just find out that Bill was okay. Um, and the news just kept pouring in, the pictures and the images. 
Um, but, you know, the BLT was gone. It was destroyed, and, you know, people wondered, you know, what happened. I mean, the guys that were, um, that was the, the headquarters. So out in the line units, they were trying to figure out what's going on. And so you find, you know, once that's done, and, you know, we had the funeral, um, you know, my family, my, my dad was a pharmacist. He left pharmacy, became a Baptist minister. I mean, I was, like I said, I was in a fog. I, I, I tried to deal with it the best I could internally. And then in 1987, after I graduated high school, I went in the Army. And the picture here on the, the left is the Beirut Memorial, which I mentioned is in Jacksonville. And so I kind of want to talk a minute about how memorials help us reflect. And so as a family member and as a veteran, we, we gather in Jacksonville, and we go to the wall. And for probably 30 years, I would meet a veteran here or there. Um, you know, I would talk to them, but, you know, none of them knew Bill, right? They didn't, they didn't have that connection with him. And so I would go there just like I was there. I mean, that's, that's me in 1987 in my Class A uniform, standing in front of the wall, you know, looking at the soldier, you know, contemplating. But it was my loss. It was, it was just, you know, I lost my brother, and I'm dealing with that the best I can. On the 30th anniversary, um, I took my kids, and that's a picture of my kids. It's the other side of the wall. And then these are my grandparents. Um, in front of, uh, you know, the names. There's 273 names on that wall. And, you know, you, you, you remember, right? They, I mean, you hear the names, but, but you, you really think about your, the loss of your loved one. And so up top, you got a picture of me and my kids, you know, scratching out on a crown, my brother's name. You know, I'm trying to share with them the history and the legacy. And this is where the story turns. So at the 30th anniversary 10 years ago, on a football field um, at Camp Lejeune, they had a muster, and they had all the, the units that had been in Beirut. You know, Jim talked about this, right? They were there. There were four different battalions that went in and out of Beirut from 82 to 84. It wasn't just, you know, Bill's battalion. And they had the loved ones come up, and they would say their name. And so I, I got up, and I said, you know, you know, Bill Gaines, Jr. And then I went and stood with the, the unit that was... Um, you know, somebody raised their hand that, that was in Bill's unit, and I went over and stood next to him. And the guy up there at the, in the middle is named Andy Mull, and he comes up to me, taps me on the shoulder, and he says, are you Bill's you know, brother? And I said, yes. And he begins to share with me a story about Bill coming in at an advance party, and they spent a week together. And you know, Jim talked about the, the bullets going back and forth, and you know, he talked about getting, you know, they were getting shot at, and, and Bill was kind of ducking and, you know, wondering what, you know, what to do. And he's like, oh, come on, they can't hit anything. And, you know, but it was a story. So that was the first time that I had connected with a veteran who knew anything about Bill. And it just, it hit me, right? It's the, you know, it's the 30th anniversary, these, these 30 years. And he told me a story about um, Sergeant Conley, um, who was the, the lead scout sniper. And, you know, I, I'd met other families, you know, through the years, and, you know, but I, but I began to kind of put faces and, and connect with people outside of just my brother. And then that afternoon, um, later, this is, a, or actually it was the next day, in the top right, you're going to see a picture of me on, on a Marine's back, and, um, and then you got a picture of me and Bill. Those are at Paris Island. Um, Bill joined the Marine Corps with a, a close friend from middle school, and that was Jeff Mosier, and I had seen him. At Paris Island was the last time I saw him. That afternoon on the 23rd of, of um, 2013, I met Jeff again for the first time. My mom brought me over, and, um, and Jeff's here tonight, but I, he had a jacket on, and on the jacket it said, in memory of Bill Gaines. So here I'd met Andy, and I'd met Jeff, and I left that you know, 30th anniversary kind of just... I got out of, you know, my thought of just about Bill, and I started thinking about all the other families and all the other veterans, and I think, you know, and I think Jeff had, re you know, emailed me something one time, but, you know, we're not alone, and all of a sudden, I didn't feel alone, because, you know, a veteran reached out to me and told me a story about Bill, and so that kind of led to a personal journey, and so for the last five years or so, I've been working with, you know, different projects, wanting to help tell the story for the, you know, the Beirut veterans, the Gold Star families. I've wanted to connect with other families. I've had the opportunity to do that, to, to get to know them and get to know their stories. Um, but I went to Port Charlotte. I wanted to do something for Bill. And so uh, that's where we lived at the time. And they created a park. Um, 
and it's a 40-acre park. There's a playground. There's tennis courts. Um, it's on the harbor. It's, it's a beautiful spot. But I wanted to do something more. And so we did it at Cation, and, and if you look at that, that's the sign. It's actually half the Beirut uh, Memorial Wall. It's got his name on it. The reason I have that picture of that Marine there is that's, I think, David, Dave Medeiros, and um, this is him carrying Sergeant Ibera, you know, out of the, the building. And he just happened to be at the, the dedication for the park. So, again, building on connections, right, when you start talking to people and doing things. So I had, we worked with an architecture firm, and they came up with the idea for the Beirut Peacekeepers Memorial Tower. And this is a design that they did, and it's a, it's a cantilever design, and I won't go through all the details, but it basically represents the bombing. Um, it looks like it's floating in the air. Um, it's got um, elements of the BLT building that was blown up. There's 241 rods um, for each one that was lost in the bombing. It actually has the name of the soldiers who were killed before the bombing, and then we're gonna list the names of all those who were killed in Beirut. Um, on the panels that are going to be, there's nine nine-foot panels um, on the tower. So I said, I try to circle this back to why sort of I'm here tonight. Why are we here tonight? Well, as you see down there, um, we did a groundbreaking and, and we're actually starting the development and building for the tower. And Jim was there. He spoke at the, the groundbreaking um, for us. And I remember asking Jim and, you know, he, was, he graciously came and did it. But the reason he did it is because him and Murray are working on the panel and the, the, the text that's going to go on there and the pictures and how we're going to describe the tower. And so I think with that, I really want to share you know, how we connected because Murray did not do a good job of explaining who she is, um, at least in my opinion. And she reached out to, to the, the Bay Ridge Veterans of America and she wanted to connect with the Marines. And I think, I don't know if she told the story tonight, but I, I mean, she was two years old um, when the bombing happened. Um, her father and mother had told her stories about the Marines and what they had done for her family. And, you know, she grew up in, in Lebanon. That's her home. And, um, and, you know, I could tell that she really had a heart for wanting to know more about the Marines and, and understanding them. And so her and I just developed a friendship. Um, you know, she connected with, with Jeff and other Marines. Um, had a passion for you know, helping us tell our story and how it connects to, to, to her story. And so in June, we actually went to Beirut, and that picture over there um, on the left is a, is a letter that my brother had sent home, and it's um, a drawing of Beirut, and it shows the French, um, the Italians, and the U.S., and, and what areas they covered. And there's a, you can't see it probably too well, but there's arrows and there's markers and mileage. Well, that's the route that he drove Captain Went around Beirut. And so Murray offered to, you know, take me to Beirut and show me around, and we retraced this path. And so that picture of me and her is taken on that same spot of that picture where Bill was, was at. And again, that's right in front of the, uh, the American embassy that was attacked in, in April of 83. Um, but when I went to Beirut, I, I didn't know what to expect, right? I mean, you're, you're, you're going to a place that, that's had a long, uh, you've thought about it, you've seen pictures, you've heard stories about it, but, you know, I wanted to understand the sense that my brother had of, you know, what did he believe about the mission and, and why was he willing to die for, um, for some kind of cause? And I showed the American flag earlier, and I think that symbol of freedom, that symbol of hope and, and um, you know, people want that, and I think my brother understood that. And so when I went to Beirut, I saw that. I saw, you know, the, the depravity. That picture on the top left is, um, is in the Sabra market. And, you know, they talked about Sabra and Chantilla and, and the refugee camps. I mean, there, there are hundreds of thousands of refugees in, in Beirut that have flooded there because of, you know, violence, because of, you know, earthquakes in Syria and, and different reasons. So, you have that, and then you have the beauty. And I mean, I, I tried to find a picture. I mean, I could, I could bore you to death. I have you know, hundreds of pictures when Murray took me out to the, the cedars and to the mountains. And I mean, I could not believe how beautiful uh, there it was. But I also couldn't believe the depravity. And there were pictures that my brother sent me from 1983 of buildings blown up and attacked. Um, and they're, 40 years later, they're still there, and they still look you know, pretty bad. The one in the middle, is the is called the um, the Holiday Inn. It was where the last battle of the Civil War that Murray talked about 
was fought. Um, they fought from floor to floor, the Christians and the Muslims. And, you know, the stories, you know, vary, but, you know, what happened is, is at the top, the Christians didn't want to be captured, and so they jumped off the roof. Um, and, you know, but that's the kind of city. This is a very prominent, it's like in the center. Um, it, was a, it was a dividing line, and people would have to go through checkpoints to get past there. And so I put down there, you know, two tails of a city, um, and, and I think that's what I saw. I saw that, you know, greatness of what could be in Beirut, and then I saw, you know, what, it, what it's going through. And so I kind of want to go through the conclusion, but, you know, we were able to go to the American embassy and the French embassy, and both embassies were, you know, incredibly helpful. Um, I wanted to meet with them to share with them about the tower, and we were able to meet and talk with the Marines. They have a, a memorial there um, at the American embassy in Beirut, and I was able to go there and lay a wreath down. Um, the embassy just bent over backwards. I mean, I was able to actually go down to the site and see um, the site of the BLT bombing, there's no marker. There's nothing to recognize what happened there that day. Um, you know, and I think that, you know, when you think about the, the memorial at Jacksonville or the, the, you know, the things that other families have done to try to remember these Marines, and, you know, in Beirut, they're not, they're, they're trying to ignore it or act like it didn't even happen. Um, but one of the things that the French and the Americans, you know, taught me before I left is, you know, there was a French colonel that we met with, and he said, you know, the mission's not over. And, you know, I saw Biblos, I saw the, 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 the level of effort that, you know, America and the French, the, the UN is putting into helping revive Beirut. And, you know, the Marines um, this October are working on planting 241 cedar trees up in the mountains, and they're going to call it the Cedar Battalion. And one day those cedars are going to take root, and they're going to grow, and they're going to provide shade, and, and hopefully Beirut will become more peaceful as a result of that and those efforts. But I think I left... Beirut feeling like, you know, we have a duty, you know, it's our duty, all of our duties to remember. And I think that's what hope, you know, you get a sense of purpose tonight of, you know, what happened in Beirut and why it's important. Um, and I hope, you know, you understand, you know, with Marae and her background and, and, and Jim being a Beirut veteran and, and how we met and the fact that we're working together to try to remember and tell the story, um, you know, everyone can do that. And I think the, the mission that, that the Marines were there for of trying to fight you know, peace, hope, and freedom, um, that mission's still there, and, and we can still help them. So with that, I'll, I thank everybody, and, um, you know, I hope you ask some questions, and I appreciate you coming tonight and listening to us. Thank you to our panelists. Um, it's now time for our question and answer session. Um, because this event is being recorded, we ask that you please wait until a microphone reaches you until, and then you can ask your question. Um, we, open, we reserve the first question for students and then we will open it up to the rest of the audience. So at this point, we're looking for our first question. Uh, thank you very much. Um, my question on remembrance um, and teaching in America. Um, in introducing this topic to uh, Americans and the hope that they will remember, um, knowing that geography and history um, for many Americans is uh, very um, cursory, uh, how, uh, in which context, and at what age should we be uh, teaching this history to Americans? How should we teach history to Americans? This history. I think it should, well, I'm gonna go, Michael. Um, I think it should start at middle school. Actually, I go even further. Um, so let me retrace that. I wasn't educated in the United States, so to be fair, I don't know what the curriculum teaches, but I also know that there's gaps in telling the history. Um, even I, as a researcher, when I'm reading about the history of the Civil War in Lebanon, usually the barracks bombing is mentioned in a sentence or two. Um, there's definitely no stories told. So, but if you ask me, it should start, all of these stories should start early on. If elementary school is too tra traumatic, maybe middle school should definitely be included in the curriculum. Well, I think I, 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 
sort of mentioned this early on, and I probably wasn't as um, explicit as I should have been, but um, our history over the last 40 years, um, and remember that we have <clears throat> been involved in 20 years of war in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, which was preceded by attacks on our homeland on 9-11, that cannot be understood without understanding Beirut. And so one can't start with why are you in Iraq and why are you in Afghanistan and 9-11 without understanding the American military experience in that part of the world in the early 80s and all those things that it said one way or the other to both Americans, our adversaries, et cetera. Remember also, and I didn't say this, that part of the rationale and the justification that the administration, the Reagan administration gave in 82, 83, and 84 was they used the language of the Cold War. That this was and is a, an antagonistic struggle not only against, you know, um, actors in the Middle East, but also our Soviet adversary. Things were couched that way. And so, again, one, one can't understand both Cold War, its denouement, and then, again, this war on terror that has really um, sort of preoccupied us for the last 20 years without understanding Beirut. So I would say that if you're going to teach that, you start in 1958 with a little bit of prologue, and then you move very quickly into um, what we're doing here. Now, it has international relations sort of implications in terms if you teach that, but it also has Middle Eastern history and American diplomatic history um, pieces as well. So you might want to ask your professors, why aren't we learning more about this? Yeah. What resources would you recommend to students who are interested in learning more about the Beirut bombings? Eddie, is that you? I can make you a list. <laughs> I have, I, have, I mean, there, there are resources out there available um, in a sense that there are a couple of uh, military memoirs that are available and accessible to general readers. Like I'm not saying, you know, you don't have necessarily to be specialized in the field to read it. However, having said that, there is definitely a gap. Um, the proof is the gentleman here, their story is not written anywhere. So yes, there are resources, but there's still room to improve. And um, actually, um, just if you type, if you Google, you know, the barracks bombing, Beirut barracks bombing, you, you will have a couple of decent resources, but, and I'm more than happy to recommend the reading list. You know, if you just want to get a real quick take on it. Um, sometimes journalists have a really good sort of way at getting at insights. And so probably um, the best insights of, during the, of that period uh, were written in a book called From Beirut to Jerusalem by Thomas Friedman. He does a great job of sort of capturing the zeitgeist of that period. Now, you know, this is 25, 30 years later after he's published it, but he won a Pulitzer Prize and it's a pretty good sort of account of how these different events uh, are woven together. So you might want to start with that. Okay. Way behind. Uh, hi. Um, this summer, several representatives from the armed forces testified in Congress talking about how the uh, armed forces are looking to miss their recruitment numbers, most notably by the thousands. I think the Army's about to miss them by 15,000 for f uh, fiscal year 2023, and the Navy to miss it by 7,000. Um, what, in your opinion, has caused like the reluctancy from, um, I think one of the slides said, like the soldiers being very proud to serve, what has changed, and do you think this will impact how um, the United States will support its um, allies overseas? I'm not sure I understood. I didn't understand the question. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I'm looking at Michael Nyberg because he's got to deal with this. 
he's got to deal with this every day. Uh, Michael's a professor at the Army War College and a great friend, and uh, I'm sure he's trying to get his head around this too. But um, it's a it's a deeply complicated social um, set of explanations. I, I I don't think we know quite yet. Um, there are certainly a lot of indicators we can point to. Um, you know who's really done a good job of sort of talking about this in, in an overall sense? And I think the Army ought to look at some of what he's written about so, uh, social change is David Brooks. Um, and he, I think if you read him closely, you'll see that, um, you know, we have everything, in our youth anyway, we have everything from a mental health crisis all the way through. Um, and obesity crises all the way through. So th all those things, all those variables come together that lead to, you know, certain outcomes. Um, don't, I couldn't give you any specific answer to that, but there are a whole lot of people working on it. Thanks. Thank you to all three of you. So you, you talk about the Baruch's bombing as something that has happened and that we understand. Is it, is it safe to challenge that a little bit and say that we still don't fully understand the consequences? I mean, you, you mentioned 9-11 and everything else that has happened. But are, are there any actual solid conclusions that we can determine from the event as, as ways of <laughs> maybe preventing the repercussions of that history? I know that's a very broad question, but, but are there any solid lessons that we have learned from the attack? I think Jim, you talked about the consequences that, I'll let Jim talk about that and the consequences of changes that happened. But if I, if I understood your question a little bit differently, it's that do we know who did it? Or that's not at all? Right, so two, two things. Do we know who did it? Yes, yes we do. And as a matter of fact, um, a couple of months ago, a article in the French newspaper came out where the French government is asking the Lebanese government to um, arrest, not arrest, to investigate two people related to the barracks bombing, to specifically to Drakkar, which is the French building. Now, realistically, this is not a go anywhere because there's an amnesty law in Lebanon that was voted after the war. So we don't even know if these people are alive or not. But definitely we have proof that indicate that, you know, Iran and the Iranian sources, Iranian fighter, and later on what became Hezbollah, um, they're behind the attacks. So yes, if you want to think of this as knowledge, yes, we've learned that. Um, what did that knowledge lead to in terms of strategical changes in the army? I think, Jim, you mentioned it in your talk. I don't know if you want to elaborate a little bit more. Yeah, I think you can point to, and I think I did yeah. mention it in terms of the um, Goldwater Nichols Act, which came on the heels of the failure in Desert One to rescue the um, American hostages in Iran. Um, the grenade failed, certain parts of the Grenada invasion were communication failures, and then the both operational intelligence failure in Beirut, not, um, not failures on the part of the Marines there, failures on the part of the chain of command. And so what was the failure on the part of the chain of command? Um, in 1983, um, the commander on the ground in Beirut, Tim Garrity, had five bosses. And so who was the most important of those bosses? Well, you probably want to ask him today. He probably, but the point simply was that at the end of it all, um, we couldn't establish accountability, responsibility, and authority in an explicit way. In other words, the authority for Lebanon rested with the UCOM commander whose headquarters was in Mon, Belgium. The operational commander was in the 6th Fleet in the Mediterranean, and the Commandant of the Marine Corps and the 2nd Marine Division commander were responsible for training and equipping said force. And so, 
to the degree that um, the commander on the ground had a chain of command that he understood, who does he prioritize? Does he prioritize his commandant, or does he prioritize the Yukon commander who he's never met, who lives in Belgium? So what we, you know, what we did after that was simply say this, that from now on the chain of command after 1986 will be the Secretary of Defense, well, the President is Commander in Chief, but Secretary of Defense, and the combatant commander in that order. They have authority, responsibility, and accountability. So if an event occurs in the Middle East today, then the CENTCOM commander at MacDill Air Force Base in this case, um, an Army general, reports directly to Secretary Austin, who reports directly to the President of the United States. The chairman is not in that chain. The United States Army Chief of Staff is not in that chain. That's it. And so you have a clear, direct line to what is it you want me to do? What's my mission? And who's responsible? So those are the sorts of things I think were positive outgrowths of that. Now, in terms of the answer about who was culpable in terms of the bombing, I'll give you three names. It's interesting because if you look at these three names, they're all in Beirut. They're all in Beirut on the 23rd of October, 1983, and they're all Iranian. Ahmed Vahidi who later on was a key leader of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps. He commanded the Quds Force in 1997, and by 2008, he was leading the nuclear proliferation effort in Iran. He's there on 23 October. Mustafa Nachar, commander of the IRGC Expeditionary Force in Lebanon, who planned and supported the bombings. He's a key role, he leads a key role later on through the 80s and early 90s in the formation of Hezbollah. And get this, he's named Iran's defense minister in 2005. 1983, 23 October, Imad Mugniya, who was born in Lebanon, was responsible not only for the Beirut bombing, TW-847, the hijacking of that airline, and the kidnapping and execution of those involved, and the kidnapping and execution of William Buckley, the CIA station chief. He was responsible for the bombings in Buenos Aires of the uh, Israeli embassy and the cultural center. He was the prime suspect in the Kobar Towers bombing in 1996, and he had a support role to Al-Qaeda in 1998 and 2001. He was assassinated in Damascus in 2008. Can't give you much information about that, but you can read between the lines. And the latest, the latest killing in Baghdad of Soleimani, he is tied directly to all three of those individuals. So Beirut has long legs. And Iran came out yesterday and said they are pursuing the assassination of an equivalent U.S. representative. So does Beirut have sort of long? Yeah, it does. Hopefully that helped a little bit. And, um, I just, I just want to add something about Soleimani. To go back, Michael, to your question about education, when Soleimani was killed, most of the Americans have no idea who Soleimani was. They just thought, oh, here's the U.S. killing another Iranian and why we're doing this, right? But again, if we had a better knowledge of history that goes back to the 80s, to Beirut, we would have known who Soleimani is. Okay, and with that, that concludes tonight's program. Please join me in thanking your, our panelists.